Why do you think spaces like the Ink of Light Festival are important in the Baha'i community? I think the Baha'i community goes through different stages of evolution. And I think at the moment, I see around the world, many Baha'is yearning for ways to communicate their values and their aspirations in different arenas, in different circles. And as someone who's involved in the arts, I've been all my life, this is a natural way of being for me. So that's why I think it's important. I think it's important for our mental and spiritual health too. I think that in our efforts to develop a universal curriculum for the Baha'i community and provide a strong foundation for our faith, uh, there's always the danger that we become literalist following the recipe and develop a kind of monoculture in the faith. So I think the arts are particularly important. I could tell you a story about why I'm motivated to do these things. Um, as a young Baha'i, I was called to be, become the manager of the British Baha'i Publishing Trust and gave up my PhD to go and take up that position. And I was very interested in film. I was studying ethnographic film and I was also interested in music, especially world music. When I came to my new job, I had all kinds of exciting ideas about how we could develop Baha'i Publishing. But I became extremely disillusioned and frustrated about what I saw a very conservative, risk-averse approaches to things like the arts. But my life changed in a moment when I went to a Baha'i conference, international conference in Montreal, Canada. And I'll never forget this. It was the largest gathering of Baha'is I'd ever attended. About 10,000 Baha'is gathered in the velodrome of the Olympic Village, which we built to house the Olympics in Canada. And on the second day, I think Douglas Martin, who was secretary, I think, of the National Assembly at that time, he came forward after the prayers in the morning. Can you imagine 10,000 people sitting in silence in this huge stadium? And he hectored and lectured the crowd for our bad behavior the previous night when artists were performing. The fact that we didn't show sufficient respect to artists by having conversations, by getting up and moving around. And he said, friends, some of these artists have been preparing for two years for this event. And last night you insulted them with your disrespect and lack of courtesy. Some of these musicians, not all of whom are Baha'is and performers, would get a better audience in the metro station than they got here. He said, tonight our organisers are under strict instructions that if you get up and move or make a noise, you will be shown from the conference and not allowed back in, you see. Now, everybody was astonished at this. And Riyal Khanum, who was on the stage, she came forward and said, Well said, Douglas. I completely agree with everything you said. Now that night, I got late. I arrived late at the velodrome. And the, the act I first saw was a very loud band from Chicago, I think, called the New World Symphony. I can't remember the name, but they were very, almost heavy metal, and the kids were up dancing in the aisles. And I was sitting at the back with a, a row of Persian ladies, all with their headscarves on, staring at this spectacle. They were recent uh, refugees from Iran. And after the performance, and I have to say, everybody behaved beautifully, and the place was packed. The lady turned to me, she said, were they good? I said, yes, they were excellent. She said, oh, I'm so glad. I do love the Baha'is to do well, she said. So that was a personal experience, and for me it was a moment of revelation that when the institutions of the faith get behind the arts, recognize their true value as an integral part of the evolution of our community, that we can make a difference. So from that moment on, I went back with renewed vision and zeal, and ever since then I've done what I can to try to support the arts and its development, both within the Baha'i community but also in terms of our outreach and dialogue with the, with the outside world. Can you share a little bit about your thoughts on what role the arts play in the Baha'i faith? Well, I think um, it's a very good question, a profound question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. But for me, art is just an important aspect of our being. We're all artistic, we're all creative. And our individual response to the revelation of Baha'u'llah, to the zeitgeist of our age, is, is very varied. Um, I remember one lady becoming a Baha'i, making a new jam recipe, making her new jam, someone's knitting sweaters. These kind of 
domestic crafts. And one might laugh at that and say, hey, this is not what we had in mind. But to me, this is a creative response to a stimulus of the human soul. And we're not here to be judgmental about what is good art and what is bad art. I think that uh, there's no such thing as Baha'i art or Baha'i music. There are Baha'is who are musicians, Baha'is who are artists, Baha'is who are doctors, Baha'is who are dentists. We should have a place in this Baha'i community. We often talk about building the foundations of a new world order, and I think that many of the institutions we've tried very hard to create, our local assemblies, our institutes, our board members, these are, if you like, the, the foundation structures of the house that Baha'u'llah has come to build. But now, when you come to a building, you don't look at the foundations, you don't look at the structures behind the walls. We look at the paintings on the walls, we look at the carpets, we need a home to live in. So for me, the importance of the arts is about creating a home for people, a place which has a welcoming spirit. And to me, this is why the arts are so important. It's a kind of invitation to people. And let's face it, we live in a very secular, materialist world. And religion does not have a good press in many places, especially in the West. But it's been my experience that art is a form of spiritual language that many people still speak. Whether they confess to a belief in, in organized religion or God, it doesn't really matter. They care about our future. They care about their children's future. They believe the importance of personal transformation, and striving after noble ideals. They believe in justice and social transformation. So the arts have an important role in this field, I think. And for me, that's what motivates me. That's what gets me up in the morning. And uh, I just love it. I, and I think that it's very important that we respect artists. We acknowledge them. Um, my son is a musician and uh, I used to cultivate his music. And I remember, you know, he would practice for weeks, write something. We would travel hundreds of miles to some Baha'i event to find that his spot had been cancelled because some talk, some speech went on for 50 minutes too long. And the arts weren't really valued within the Baha'i community at that stage. But I think that that has changed. I think around the world I see more and more communities embracing the arts. Not, I use a, quite a strong word here, I mean, some Baha'is will be aware that Shoghi Effendi talked about the dangers of the prostitution of the arts. I'm not sure many people have talked or thought about that, but for me one way we prostitute the arts is by using the arts in a wrong way. We abuse the arts maybe to sex up another event, <laughs> to attract people and get them there under false pretenses. You know, to me, that's prostitution of the arts, and that's not something we should be doing. I mean, the real value of the arts is to see it's just as important as anything else we do, that we our faith is based on the promotion of sacred values, of a spiritual reality behind everything. And the arts is a kind of language that gives us access to those things. So I find it tremendously empowering, you know, and the, the, the moments which have changed my life, which have kept me going as a Baha'i have been artistic moments. So I want to share that with other people. What do you hope participants take away from the Ink of Light Festival? Well, three things really. First of all, um, an affirmation, you know, confidence, uh, that what they're doing is okay, is important, and is valued and recognized. Secondly, is uh, a greater understanding of who they are and what they're doing and what their their work is. And we tend to put people in boxes. So, for example, I, I think many people reinvent themselves continually. You know, you could be a poet who becomes a filmmaker or a musician who becomes a uh, a painter, or whatever. And and by bringing people together from across the creative spectrum. People find a common experience, and I think that's very important. So there's a kind of solidarity which is created. More than just networking, and networking is a very superficial thing. We're talking about creating spiritual bonds between people, which are life, last a lifetime. And the third thing is about sharing knowledge and resources. You know, I once, uh, I gave a creative circle in Austria to a non-Baha'i group actually some years ago, and I used the parable of, uh, it was a Christian-funded thing. Um, of the loaves and the fishes. Do you know that story, the loaves and the fishes and uh, uh, from the Bible, where Jesus is giving a sermon, and sermon on the mount, and there's all these people gathered together, and they feed 
the people with, I never get the numbers right, is it five loaves and three fishes or five fishes and three loaves, something like that. And all these people are fed. Well, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor, the story. But I was reflecting on that. And I did some research into the lifestyle of the people. People used to carry food with them. I mean, people were always moving around. They always carried food with them. And I was trying to imagine all these people. I went to Israel and I went to those, those places and I was trying to imagine that, that moment from the Bible story. And I realized that through the act of sacrifice of the, Jesus and the disciples sharing their food with other people, other people were motivated to share their food too and that everybody was fed. And I found a great parallel in the arts because the greatest problem artists have is getting funding for things. But it's been my experience that few artists are successful as individuals. To be successful as an artist, whatever your field might be, you really do need to feel the support of the community. Whether it could be a spouse, a family, a local community, or, or, or a wider community, it's very hard to make it by yourself. But the lesson is that if the spirit is there, if the spirit is the motivating force and it's really pure spirit, then the resources will come. And I've never found a really good arts project fail because of lack of funding. It's been my experience. And I'll say to artists who wrestle with, who write to me asking for money and support, I go back with other questions about, well, what have you done? What sacrifices are you making? Because if you can show that you're making those sacrifices, that you're putting your own efforts and resources into it, then this will attract resources from elsewhere. Can you tell us a bit more about the importance of the arts and share some personal reflections? I think that art, ever since human beings sat and looked at the fire together in their cave, um, there's been a desire to reflect their experience in some way. And there are many things which can't be put into words. I mean, I'm a writer and an editor, and I don't pretend to be an artist, but I enjoy being around artists because it fills my soul. And um, so art is just like oxygen to me. I, I can't imagine a world without art. And um, I think all civilizations are measured to some extent by the great art in which they produce. I mean, how do we know what a civilization is? Uh, so it's a great mark of our humanity, I think. It's also very inclusive because not all of us do well in chalk and talk environments. And I think that um, I was reflecting on a friend of mine. I'm very interested in mental health issues. So for example, I was a prison visitor and um, I discovered that there's a great correlation between violence in young men and illiteracy. So there are a lot of, I worked with murderers and violent criminals and my job was just to teach them basic literacy and get them to tell their story as a way of personal healing and also to give them a better chance of making it on the outside once they'd left prison. So the basic ability to communicate, whether it's through words or through images and sounds, I think is very important. So it's an aspect of our communication, I think. And, you know, it's a lonely world. And some people become artists because they don't function very well in normal society. Um, there's a lot of research into things like um, what we call neurotypical uh, personalities. And many artists are not neurotypical. They might be somewhere on the autistic spectrum or they might be very introverted or extroverted or unbalanced in some ways. And uh, I think if you're really trying to build a healthy community, we need to make space for all kinds of people. So we have to make a conscious effort to acknowledge the work of artists and to embrace them and involve them in our community and to value what they do. I don't think we should, artists deserve any special treatment. I don't think they're somehow more ethical or, or better than anybody else. Some artists think they are. But I think that uh, as a community, we have to make conscious effort to embrace. And I think if we're going to create a community where everybody can find a home, then art has to be one of the languages we speak. But how do we overcome natural conservatism and, you know, committees and assemblies and uh, advisory boards are naturally conservative and risk averse. And for anybody who's been involved in the arts, you know that it doesn't work like a bureaucracy. So very often you have to seize the moment, the coincidence of factors, of timing, of people, of spirit and energy. Very often it's a very, very fragile thing. 
So you cannot plan everything, you cannot coordinate or manage everything, but we have to create the space for these flowers to bloom. And so I have a small arts foundation. That's what we try to do. We try to create a kind of garden where people can come and find that space to nurture their creative potential. And whether it's pursuing your own muse or working in collaboration with others, one of the great discoveries I think I've made is that it doesn't matter what kind of art, whether you're a writer, a painter, a filmmaker, musician, the creative challenge is broadly similar. You know, the, the terror of the blank sheet of paper. You know, I mean, how do you embrace that? The creative process is, is very similar. And we don't need to be professional, um, but we can be serious artists, take our art seriously and, and try to strive for perfection, whatever we do. Maybe it's also a function of age. I've, I'm a bit scared, actually. I've reached retirement age and I suddenly realise I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up, you know? It's a bit scary. But it used to be, I worked with different kinds of groups of people throughout the years, and very often when people got to retirement age, they would take up basket weaving or oil painting or something as a, as a hobby. But there's a big transformation going on. People now living 20, 30, 40 years beyond retirement. So they're developing second, third careers as serious artists, becoming writers, becoming musicians, becoming painters. So I think this is a wonderful thing. You know, it's a way of unifying the generations as well. The young people and older people can come together through the artistic process. These are some of my personal observations. Can you tell us a little bit about your Dazzling Spark Arts Foundation? I am from Scotland, Edinburgh. Abdu Baha came to visit Edinburgh. It was the most gnarly part of his uh, tour of the West. And he came for five days um, to Edinburgh in, 1930, in 1913. And um, on the 75th anniversary of his visit there, I was involved in a number of things, publications, exhibitions, uh, tours, things like that. And for the centenary, I was very excited. I had all these ideas. I wanted to make a movie. I wanted to do more publications. But um, I didn't get the feeling from other people that they were ready for that. So. One of the people who accompanied Abdul Bahani's trip, Lutfullah Hakim, talked about those never to be forgotten days, he wrote in his diary, and that stuck in my heart. And I thought, okay, well, let's try to make sure these days are never forgotten. So we wanted to set up a permanent legacy for Abdul Baha's visit. And Abdul Baha's mission in coming to Scotland, the truth of the West, was to promote peace and social solidarity. So I think it's a message that, that is still relevant today. And I think that um, our foundation is to try to do that see, through the medium of the arts. So it's a small foundation. Uh, I'm not rich, I'm a teacher, um, and I worked for a charity for 20 years. So I made the decision not to have a car. So the money I normally spend on a car every year is the money I put into the foundation. And we have a number of things we do. We sponsor uh, people to uh, travel scholarships, residencies, tours, exhibitions. We've commissioned some films, pieces of sculpture, and we offer um, free places at our creative circles. So the Dazzling Spark Arts Foundation, which is called, is, is based on this word Dazzling Spark, which from a little known tablet of Abdul Bahari talks about the power of the arts to uh, create a dazzling spark which illumines the heavens, enlightens all sides. And to me, it's a very appropriate term. And interesting enough, um, at the same time, other groups around the world are coming up with very similar concepts. In Ireland, we have spark in the dark. Here in Australia, we have uh, writing with light. This seems to be uh, a movement within the worldwide Baha'i community for more and more of this kind of uh, gathering for artists and writers. So um, this summer, we'll be hosting our, what we call creative circles. Uh, in July at a retreat in Northumberland. We have focus on literary arts, music and the performing arts, and visual arts. One of the things that makes it different from a normal arts retreat, I think, is we have spirit at the center of our discourse. And magical things happen when artists come together in that spirit. So we try to create a very welcoming, nurturing environment 
Uh, it's quite intimate, really. We don't like large groups, but we find that the quality of the dialogue is important. So I'm really looking forward to this. And in fact, this is what keeps me alive, I think. I look forward so much to these events. And interestingly enough, many people who've come to these things have taught, found them very life-affirming. Yeah, the sad thing is that many people who are artists don't find a home in the Baha'i community, and they find this kind of event somewhere where they can be themselves and have their work acknowledged and recognized and find common dialogue with others. And that's a wonderful thing. It's lonely out there, you know, <laughs> and we are supposed to become masters of unity. So this is one, one circle of unity that we can create. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences in the Baha'i publishing world and what you'd like to see more of? Well, I have been out of the game for a while. In a sense, I, I was working with an institutional publisher for many years, and uh, I was manager and editor at the Baha'i Publishing Trust in the United Kingdom, which was the first Baha'i Publishing Trust. There were publishing committees and agencies, but the Publishing Trust as a model was set up in the UK in 1937, and was funded by the first 50 pounds came from Shoghi Effendi to start that. And the mission was to promote Baha'i publishing wherever the English language was spoken. So it was always a global mission. And the trust was used as a model for other countries because most Baha'i literature is translated from the English. So I had the opportunity to travel and to work with Baha'i publishing agencies around the world, which was fantastic. The US, which is the biggest market for English language Baha'i books, it was more concerned, I think, uh, with its own backyard because it's a very big country and had a lot of its own challenges. So the UK Trust was more global in its outlook and the US is more kind of North America focused. And in the 70s, 80s and 90s, there was quite a big growth of Baha'i publishing and we had the, the emergence of independent publishers um, who are sometimes wholly Baha'i owned or partly Baha'i owned. And they had a sort of broader agenda which would try to promote Baha'i ideas, crossover markets we talked about. And I was involved in collaborations with non-Baha'i publishers and trying to develop imprints for trade book distribution. Because people say, why don't we have Baha'i books in bookstores? You know, there was a general ignorance. There was a frustration. People thought, oh, there's some, somebody stopping people getting to hear about Baha'i books. But the lesson we learned was this, that even when we were successful in repackaging our books and negotiating trade terms to get book wholesalers and libraries and bookshops to stock our books, people still didn't buy them. So it wasn't that there was a lack of access to literature. The problem was that our books weren't very good. Our writers weren't skilled enough in communicating their ideas. And you know, if you're in the marketplace for ideas, you need to know the market. So one of the advices I would give to potential writers is go and read some books by other writers about this area, and then you can compare and self-evaluate your own work and then learn something and bring it to the table. And I think that uh, we need to cultivate good writing, and that happens at many levels, from our children's classes right through to our work, summer schools and to other things we need to cultivate writing. But join a writer's club, you know, become an author, become a blogger, develop your skills, because there's many forms of publishing. The word publish from the Latin publicare just means to noise abroad. Uh, in the raw, ancient Rome, the people used to stand on stones and shout out the words from the Senate. That was publishing. So today we have blogs. Today we have many forms of publishing. Um, just like everybody thinks they're a filmmaker and a photographer now, everybody thinks because they can use a keyboard that they know how to write. No. I think writing is a skill, a craft, and it has to be nurtured and, and uh, standards have to be raised. The good news is, I'm not a critic, I actually think the writing is improving. I mean, everybody says, oh, the good old days, but actually more and more people are writing now than ever before. So I have great hopes for the future. What advice would you give to others who wish to write a book? Well, it's a great question. And uh, as someone who is an editor for many years, we often have the story of one in a million. We talk about, you know, for every thousand people who have an idea for a book, only one will start doing it. And for every thousand people who start writing a book, uh, only one ever gets published. You know, I think so it's a, there are many stages in the process. The desire to communicate, tell your life story, I think is a good one. And that needs to be nourished and encouraged. 
And I think we can do that in different ways. I mean, not everybody is a novelist, but we can start with short stories, we can start with poems, pieces of prose, songs, uh, films. Films are a kind of writing, you know, we have to tell the story. Uh, through dance, whatever our medium might be, we can start ways to tell our story. The idea of a book, I think, as a sort of mythological status, that once you've published a book, somehow you've made it, you're done and dusted, that's it. We want our life to mean something, to have recognition and value. So I think the desire to have a book is a good one, it's a noble one. But there's another truth, and that is that um, there are also many books that nobody reads. Many people would send me their script, which has represented 10, 20 years of their life or their life story. And it's my job as an editor to say, well, actually, nobody's interested in that. <laughs> there are three men and a dog who will ever read this script. And that's a terrible slap in the face to somebody who's put their heart and soul into something. So there's many forms of publishing. And I think that um, I think what you're doing, I mean, the blogs are very important. You need to develop your craft as a writer to become a book worthy of publication, I think, um, has to be well-crafted and it takes time and skill and patience. I mean, there are those people who can turn out books like sausages, you know, and make money out of it, but I don't think that's the question you're asking. I think desire to communicate, to reach out, to make a difference, to be acknowledged, this is what people mean when they say, I want to make a book. And the collaboration is a wonderful thing, you know. I mean, I was just in the theatre. So one question I would say to people is, OK, you want to write a book, have you considered writing a short play or have you considered doing a radio spot or a, a graphic novel or something rather than just a book? I mean, I don't know the, the, the number of books published now, but it's you know, hundreds of thousands of titles. And if you go into a bookshop, you've got less than 1% of all the books being written are, 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 are in the bookshop. So I suppose my answer is, do you really want to write a book? Or do you really want to do something else? Can you share a little bit about Abdul Baha's visit to Edinburgh, Scotland? Well, you know, um, I'm from Edinburgh. I was born there, although I was raised overseas. And uh, when I was a young Baha'i, I became secretary of the Assembly, Baha'i Assembly in Edinburgh. So I had the chance to look at the records, the history of the community. And later in my work uh, at the Baha'i Publishing Trust in the UK, I was able to um, do some research and work with authors to try to tell the story of Abdu'l Baha. I was involved in an exhibition and I actually gave talks uh, in the places that Abdu'l Baha talked. Now, there had been an extensive correspondence in the press before Abdu'l Baha's actual visit, and um, it, that continued after his visit, so it was a big, big news. And there are some of the stories when Abdu'l Baha came down the main thoroughfare, Princess Street, in an open carriage the people cheering him as they would a member of royalty. So he received a great welcome and he was definitely seen as a, a great ambassador of peace. This is on the eve of the First World War, of course, in 1913. And the air was br bristling with the, the threat of war and also with women's rights. These are the other big issues. And Abdul Baha addressed both of these in his talks in Edinburgh and he received a very large audience. What many people don't know is the, the more the details. Um, Edinburgh is quite a northerly city, and so Edinburgh was the most furthest north that Abdu'l-Baha ever travelled on his west and his travels. And um, there's a lovely little story about how he felt the cold and uh, efforts were made to provide for his greater comfort and he was taken to a store and I think they purchased woolen undergarments for Abdu'l-Baha and I took a great pleasure in <laughs> thinking of Abdu'l-Baha in that situation. But Edinburgh is a very beautiful city, and um, Abdul Baha, in his visit, he uh, often remarked uh, on the beauty of the city. And he met with artists, he had his portrait painted there, he met with students, he met with many different groups, and uh, he had a lasting impact. And the book, The Seven Candles of Unity, tells that entire story if people are interested. And he was the guest of some of the literati and glitterati of, uh, of Edinburgh society. And um, one of his companions on that trip spoke about these never-to-be-forgotten days. So I was thinking, what sort of legacy would be fitting? And Edinburgh is really becomes the arts capital of the world once every year. It's the biggest arts festival in the world. And a lot of world premiere events take place there. 
So it's part of my dream that we should have a Baha'i Arts organisation based in Edinburgh. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work in future, but instinctively I feel this is the right thing to do. So in the few years that we've had our foundation, we've supported artists, we've done commissions, we've provided scholarships and residencies, uh, paid for films, uh, tours, all kinds of things. And uh, we also have these creative circles. And part of our mission is to promote the spiritual and social agenda of Abdu Baha, which was the transformation of society. How do you think a community can help foster a culture of creativity? I've lived in Asia now for many years, and one of the blessings of Asia is its diversity. And some of your listeners and viewers may have heard of the island of Bali in Indonesia, which is a very interesting mixture of religious and spiritual influences. Now, out of the 365 days in the year, I think more than 200 are feast days or special sacred days. So what's interesting about Bali is almost the entire community, at least the village level in traditional society, is engaged in creating beautiful things to celebrate the sacred in some shape or form. It's something that everybody's engaged with all of the time. It's a very big part of their life. And these are mostly poor hill farmers or fishermen, and they're devoting a very large part of the resources to the arts. So there's an example in society of uh, how the rich texture of civilization is created through effort. So I think one of the answers is we have to put effort and resources into it. It doesn't happen by itself. A second thing is really, I think, in terms of the status we give to arts and understanding the role of the artist in society. I uh, lived in the Shetland Islands for some years and uh, I became very interested. I also visited Norway, which is one of my favourite places and um, I attended a, a wedding in uh, Stavanger, Norway. And one of the things that I really was very impressed with when I visited friends and their households, just ordinary people, they didn't show me their latest TV or their latest gun or their latest car. What they did show me was the painting they had in the hall done by a local artist or a photograph or a piece of sculpture. They were so proud of their local artists and they saw it as an act of citizenship to support and encourage local artists. So it's a question of value and priority. So these were just ordinary societies, but which had such wonderful diversity of art because they placed the high value on it. So is the resource argument, there's the respect and the value we place on artists. And the third thing is about participation. I uh, organised uh, some projects in China um, and uh, one of the things I did was try to bring resources together to promote education in the rural parts of China where educational services are quite poor. And this particular project called the Gate Project, which I did a number of years ago, we brought together uh, teachers from the States, Australia, around Asia, and we provided uh, English language instruction. And uh, some of the teachers who had come to this program, which uh, my foundation put together, they wanted us to visit them in their village in the high plateaus of the Tibetan range. These were the Tibetan autonomous regions inside China. And they didn't receive very many visitors. So we took a bus away up the mountain. The road was blocked. We had to back down all the way down the mountain, go up another part of the mountain. We arrived at this town quite late. And there were no electricities, there was no uh, street lamps, it was getting dark. And the entire town had come out to meet us. And they were streaming away, but as our bus pulled in, they turned around and came back to the centre. And uh, I love Scottish dancing, and I had some tapes of Scottish dancing, and I taught some, I did some performance, and taught them some uh, Scottish country dancing, just as a way of celebration. But very soon, the entire town must have been a thousand people, danced for me in a series of concentric circles. Small children holding hands, shoulders at their shoulder, their big brothers and sisters, then the youth, then the mothers and fathers, and the grandparents too, all dancing in perfect rhythm, in swaying in different directions. And I was so moved by this act of unity. Because there was I trying to teach these people about unity, and they were doing it every day. And I said, 
how do you do this? And he said, well, we do it for one hour every morning. <laughs> the entire, every school, the communities, we dance for an hour. So that had a huge impact upon me because the togetherness of that community was through participation. So there are many examples in the societies around the world we can borrow if we want to find methods of encouragement. And it's not that hard, actually. We just need to do it.